Welcome to the Jasmine Star Show. I am joined today by the ever amazing, super fabulous, over the top, Amy Kardashian. No, just kidding. <laughs> Her name is Amy Porterfield. I casually throw in a Kardashian reference because she is that fabulous. For those of you who don't know, Amy is a brilliant entrepreneur, a powerhouse, and she cares about people, which is what makes her so amazing at what she does. Today, we are going to be talking about leaving things that are no longer serving us. Yes. How is that for a teaser? Ugh, love it. You know, I started this conversation with Amy and I said, Amy, it's not enough to have a good podcast. I want to be the best podcast you've ever been on. She did. She, and, and basically, like, you like to be the best of the best. No, I want to be you. the best for you. What, oh. what, what, like, let's not, let's, okay. let's not, I mean, I am competitive, but really the most competitive when it comes to my friends. Cause I'm just like, I want you to write a handwritten letter to Hobie and say, my life was changed <laughs> being on Jasmine's podcast. Done. Okay. Done. Okay. I already feel it. I feel like it's going to be the best of the best. And I'm going to write the letter for you and then you can <laughs> sign it and send Done. it to Hobie. Even better. Uh, okay. So this conversation, I, I don't want people to know that this conversation happens at least every day. At least, if not twice a day. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, Amy and I send voice messages to each other. Yes. So when is the last time we've actually spoken on the phone? Oh, we don't. One we don't. time you <laughs> were calling me and I was like, why is she calling me? It like, was an we, accident. We don't do this. It was a butt dial. I was, it was like, a butt dial. we don't talk on the phone. I don't even think I answered it. I was like, no, no, you no, did no. It. I told so, her this. I was actually in a perilous situation. <laughs> I needed her help. And she didn't answer. Oh my gosh, that <laughs> is true. What if that were the case? But it's been years since we've been doing that. I know. Years. So Amy and I communicate on the daily. And it's an asynchronous friendship in that like yeah. we connect when we can and it's not time sensitive. There have been yeah. times where um, it takes me a couple days to respond Same. or it might take you a couple days to respond and then there's like zero attachment. Like we'll come up like for air and be like, it was a really hard week. And then we'd like to know the big things, the small things and the celebrations. And yeah. I think what makes our friendship um, really genuine is that we can say, uh, when we're not in a good space, mm -hmm. what we need from the other person and setting it parameters. But then also the biggest thing is having somebody who's in your corner. Yes. So I share things like the big losses and then big wins. Yes. And you are like ultra cheerleader, like you got this. Yes. And I hope I'm the same Absolutely. for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I say the thing, th things to you that I don't even tell Hobie sometimes. Oh, speaking of Hobie, my most favorite is when you send me messages and you can overhear. Okay, this is embarrassing. <laughs> this, okay, so we're starting here. We're starting the podcast here, which is like, wow, go ahead, spill the tea. I'm just going to brew another pot because you just spilled the freaking tea. So yes. tell, the, tell okay. everybody, like, Hobie likes me, but Hobie thinks I'm a, a little, little extra. A, li a little. Or a lot. A lot. Yeah. So Hobie will overhear the messages and he will say, what is happening? Is she been drinking what, or taking like tons of caffeine or something? Because you talk a mile a minute. And so sometimes he's like, whoa, she's a little bit unhinged, but I like her. Yeah. So sometimes okay. he hears so that. I don't talk that. Like, sometimes you leave messages and you'll say, oh, Hobie's not listening right I now. I do. I'm like, is Hobie in the room? Because Hobie thinks I day drink and I literally have one alcoholic drink a week. And it's like, I'm just like this in general. Yeah. So, bless your heart for being my friend. He's just like, you're a special breed you are. to being out, to hang out with that girl. Yeah. Um, but because you're a special breed, I think that's going to be like the entry point of this conversation because, because you're such an advocate for other people. One of the things that I think has like been pivotal in how we have our conversations is you're always reminding me to let go of things that aren't serving me yes. or to choose a better path or to choose a different thought or to challenge ourselves. And one of the things when you told me that you were writing a book and people are listening right now, they're like, no, 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 this is not a book conversation. I'm like, no, it's not a book no. conversation. No. This is a, this is a, how do I become a different person that is serving my highest self conversation? Yes. And it happens to be wrapped up in the, what is serving you now? And oftentimes it's anchored by family, mm -hmm. work yes. and finances. Yes. So we're going to kind of dwell a little bit in all of those things, but a little bit on work. But if we were to talk about things that aren't serving us, what are some of the things that keep us in a place where we're like, it feels safe, it's not bad? Like, why do we stay in these spaces? Okay, first of all, I call these the safety shield. Everyone has a safety shield. And a safety shield is something that you put up to stay safe, but also comfortable. When mm. you're safe, you're usually very comfortable. But we all know that when you're safe and comfortable, there is no growth. So that is the reason why we have to let go of the shield. And the shield mm. can look exactly like you said. It could look like a job. It could look like one-on-one -on -one clients where you're hitting that max. You're never going to be able to scale a business with just doing one-on-one. -on -one. It can also look like, this is one that's come up a lot lately, a spouse that makes more money than you. 
If your spouse is making more money than you and you're trying to get this hobby to be a full-time thing, well, nothing really is making you make money if you already are. Your bills are paid and things are comfortable. Mm. So a lot of, especially women have said to me lately, my shield is my spouse because he makes most of the money. So that's kind of a big one. Not for everybody, but it comes up. Um, it also could be um, a, a boss, like ha not only just a job, but having a boss so you Ooh. don't have to call the shots. That's a shield as well. So we all have a shield. One way or another, it's going to come up. And so for us, like we're hardwired, and this is what my therapist said, we're hardwired for safety. Yes. And so even if we're conscious or subconscious, we kind of put things in our way to keep us safe. And so sometimes we stay in situations because they make us feel safe, but are they really yes. serving our higher self? Right. Okay. So as a slight pivot, you and I were talking about timelines. Now we're going to get back to the shields. Okay. But I want this podcast to give people an insight of like, Amy, the Amy Porterfield that yeah. I know yeah. that's not only a future New York Times bestselling author and like a, you know, a powerhouse businesswoman. We're talking about when we were going to launch this podcast. Yes. Now we're recording it and we're like, I'm like, Amy, how can I best be a service? Because I'm super competitive and <laughs> I want you to be on that best selling, best sellers list. And Amen. I want to drop this podcast at the right time. And we were debating, do we drop it on February 7th yes. or February 14th? Okay. Now, I wanted to go for the 14th because Why? do you remember, I think it was like three years ago, you invited me on a clubhouse event yes. called Galentine's. Yes. And you and I are on this clubhouse event and it was a little brutal. Okay. It was a little. <laughs> they all were a little brutal. Okay. Let's be kidding. Okay. These clubhouses were brutal. And I remember you and I are on clubhouse and we're texting each yes. other. Like, how do we get out it of this rough. situation? It was rough. So yes. we committed. Now, here's the thing. I want to draw a parallel between what is safe and letting go what isn't serving us. Okay. So we're on this clubhouse and we're like, how do we get out? And I feel like myself that there's been a pattern of like, how do I get out? Not just of this clubhouse, but how do I get out of the negative thought patterns? How do I get out of something that I know isn't serving me, but makes me scared to make this decision? Yes. And so you and I had a conversation. I'll leave the, um, the details a little bit vague, but you and I had a conversation and I said, I am currently working with somebody and I know that it's not serving me, but I feel afraid of letting that person go because I don't know what's on the other side of it. Yes. That was a safety shield. Yes. And what did you tell me and how do we parlay that into what is actually in your book, but actually what you believe in, what you talk to your friends about? Okay, so I love this topic because I created this concept called the path of possibility, okay? Mm -hmm. So the path of possibility, you have to look at it in uh, three different circles, a smaller circle, a bigger, and a really big circle, okay? okay. And they're going, is this parallel? No, they're going horizontal. Well, they're going horizontal, but then you can have two lines that are horizontal and that's parallel. Okay, not parallel, okay. they're going horizontal, okay? <laughs> and it's like, uh, if you can't see me, it's like one step here, then move to the left, and then move yes. to the left more, okay? okay? So you're starting with the present. The present is what we know, okay? It's what we know. We're comfortable and safe there because we know how to navigate the present most of the time. Now, to get to the third circle, which is possibility, what you want, just like what you were saying, you know you need to leave this thing behind to get to really where you want, but you're afraid of the unknown. So the unknown is the possibility. It mm -hmm. could be amazing, we just don't know. The reason why we're afraid of the unknown is because what is in between present and possibility, which is absolutely pain. There is no way to go from where you are now to somewhere better and bigger without you being willing to walk through the pain. And the pain is the unknown, mm -hmm. the fear of it not working out, the challenges that are going to come when you go through it. Mm -hmm. We all have to go through the pain. Like it has to get worse before it gets better. Most of the time when we're going for something big, right? So when mm. you're thinking about the pain of what is going to happen or what do I need to go through, I talk about this capacity for zero. All right, so this capacity for zero is how willing are you to start over? How, how mm. willing are you to actually say, I'll burn it all down and build it back up if I have to, Ooh. because what I want Ooh. is so clear. And so the stronger your capacity for zero, the more likely you are to stick it out and to get to the possibility. But we have to look at ourselves and say, am I willing to burn it all down to get what I want? to like start over and build it back better. Mm. And the thing is, the wor word is willing. You might not have to burn it all down, but worst yep. case scenario, 
would you be willing to? There's like, one give me, very specific Okay, but are you going to give the same story to everybody else? Because I want, okay. I want like the, this, this does not exist Ooh. on any other outlet. Ooh, okay. Well, that really is difficult because I know. the biggest story is my partnership, but it's in the book. And I, I, and I was there for it. You were there. So let's Ames, talk let's about talk it. About okay. No, no, we're talking, right. about, okay. it. We're okay. talking we'll about it. We'll all think of another story later on. So, yeah, for you. somebody else. Oh, for somebody. No, 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 no. Oh, I for someone else. Yeah, I mean, okay. come on, girl. I'll think of something. First rights on this. She's so bossy. She's just bossy. I'm bossy baby. I'm bossy. I'm a boss. I ain't bossy. Okay. 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 So Jasmine was a huge part of this. So this is so appropriate. All right. I got into my business like three years in, almost hit a million dollars that year. And, uh, I was in a partnership with some of my peers and I presented this offer to one of the guys in the partnership to help me with my business. Just help me. You mean in a mastermind? In a mastermind. What did I say? You said partnership. Oh, yeah. So you were uh, three years in a million dollars in a mastermind. Yes. Yes. And there was this guy that was doing amazing things with his business, kind of a similar business. And I said, can you help me do this one area of my business? And he said, after a few days, he said, I have a better idea. Let me be 50, 50 partner and I can blow this up with you. Mm. And ask me how long I debated, thought about it, talked to people, looked to mentors. Like how long did that take me? Ask me that question. How long, <laughs> what was your due diligence? Do you like that um, word? Precisely one night of sleep. Oh. One night of sleep, I woke up the next morning and I said, let's do it. And the reason I did that is because I have always thought I can't do this alone. And here's worse mm. yet. I always thought I need a man to help me. I grew up with a really strict father who was my first boss, told me what to do. It was his way or the highway. I, my job was to obey. And it, that was very ingrained in me. Mm. Then I went on to corporate and I had all these male bosses and I was good with having a boss. I was good with someone telling me what to do and when to do it. And I figured out how, and then I got the awards and the accolades and the data girl, you're doing great. And I loved it. I soaked it in. And so I was good at having a boss. And then when this guy came to me and said, let me be a 50, 50 partner. I thought, mm. I, I know how to do this. Yep. And so one night of sleep, I said, yes. He did, did you talk to Hobie about it? I talked to Hobie and I can't remember the conversations crystal clear. And I wonder if it's because I don't want to remember. Mm. Like I don't ever remember him saying, whoa, babe, hold on. But I also don't remember him saying, go for it. So I think it was a very murky time for me that I just yeah. thought, just do it, Amy, just do it. Mm -hmm. Out of desperation almost. And my business was doing great. So that's what was so interesting. What do you think the desperation this. came from? Fear that I did not have what it took to actually continue this. Like, oh, this is, I got lucky, mm. but I can't continue this into where I wanted to go. Got so it. it was the fear that I didn't have what it took. Mm. So, oh gosh, this whole situation with this partner was such a huge therapy session that cost me a lot of tears. But, you know, everything, you look back and you're glad it happened. It's so basically what happened is he became my partner and the business exploded. It did really, really well. He is so intelligent and smart and strategic that his ideas were incredible. I did all of them. They worked out great. A few years in, I realized I don't even know who I am. I am this yes girl that is doing everything. And I felt like I was just saying yes to everything he wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, I am a boss. I have a boss again and my whole goal of leaving corporate was to have freedom. And so I, but I was so scared to get out of the partnership because I didn't know what was on the other side of it. And I was even more scared of the pain, the mm -hmm. middle part of what is this going to cost me? Uh, I might have to pay to get my business back. Like what, it, what the heck? Or the worst case scenario, we couldn't come to a decision to separate and I'd have to shut down the business that yeah. I created from scratch. So with your you name know, attached, with my name attached, yeah. my brand, my reputation. So as you know, I cried for about an entire year. Like I couldn't stop the tears. I'd go to bed crying. I'd wake up crying. The fear of losing something I started and the fact that I made the decision and then I messed it up. This has nothing to do with my partner. He's a great guy and he did great stuff. Everything to do with why I said yes and why I stayed in it so long. And so this Can one. Can I also speak to something else? Yeah. I'm scared what's coming. Well, when we talk about the pain, we talk about the identifiables, um, money, um, shutting down the business. But one of the things that was an unidentifiable thing was, can you do it on your own? Like what happens if there's a partnership and you guys go your separate ways and it didn't match or supersede what you had done together? Ugh. And that was part of the pain, Ames. And, You're every, right. and I remember like a very small group of people, we sat across from you and we just said like, you are so capable of 
Worst case scenario, maintaining what has already been built. That was the worst case scenario. And of course, you blew everybody's expectations out of the water, but that's not here or there. But I really want to dwell in the pain area because I think that from an outsider's perspective, in being your friend, yeah. when people look at you, you have like that shimmer. Like you have the quality of somebody who walks into a room and then the air fills a little bit brighter and then there's like, you touch a glass of water and there's glitter left over <laughs> and then like there's little like puppies that hang out at your feet. This is and why like I love Jasmine. You hang out and then like there's a bird that lands on your hand. <laughs> like you have the Amy Porterfield effect and I, I just think that maybe deep down you know that there's a twinge of that to be true mm -hmm. or else you would be like, nothing resonates with that. If there's a kernel that resonates with it, that is what you emanate to other people. Mm -hmm. So from the outside, when you talk about present, pain and possibility. And when we hear the pain and we talk about la like lack of money, we're like, okay, we identify, but like, what does that really mean? And then lack of uh, losing the business, like, yeah. oh, pain. But like, what, what, like the deeper thing that I saw as a friend was, can I do it the same or better? It's absolutely true. More so, what if I can't do it right. at all? What would that say right. about me? Right. Everything I've always right. thought about myself would be true then. Yeah, because it wasn't just a business thing; it was an identity thing. Very much of who I was. Okay, and yes. I want, I want to, like, I really want to highlight that. And I didn't even ask for permission to share oh, that, but I feel so like right. people who are listening, it's just like, listen, let's call it for what it is. It's never just business. There's so many layers to it, and so the more we talk about the layers, the more that we see ourselves in that story. Absolutely, because we all want to walk into a room and have puppies at our feet and touch water turns into <laughs> glitter. Um, okay, so we're now at the point from the mastermind, mm -hmm. you sleep on it one night, yeah. you say yes, mm -hmm. the business explodes, Doing great. you realize I have a boss of a business that I had started and that person is great and has done great things. I need to let go of something that is yeah. no longer serving me. Absolutely. And so here we are here and you're are. sitting in the pain. What I'm are sitting the, in the pain. What are the, what did you do to help you get through the pain? And then what do you wish you had done differently Ooh. to get through the pain? Okay, so what I did to get through the pain is I counted on friends, as you know. I could name two to three people that got me through that and you were one of them, so thank you, my sweet friend. Mm -hmm. And so I went to my friends a lot and I needed that. And so that was huge for me. Don't ever go through something really difficult and painful Good. alone. Number two is that I also worked with a therapist during that time. That was something I needed to do because this pain was uncovering so many yes. of my insecurities. Yes, because it's not about business. It's, it's not other, about yeah. business, mm -hmm. yeah. So I realized, holy cow, I've got some serious work to do on myself. Mm -hmm. So I started to work on myself that year. And uh, what happened was one night I went to sleep in the whole messy middle of this, and I had to get lawyers. Okay, there were lawyers involved, there were documents involved, things I'd never been involved in before. And my lawyer was like a bulldog. So he's like, go, go, go. And I'm like, no, 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 hold on, that's not feeling right, hold on a second. I went to bed that night and cried myself to sleep, woke up with swollen eyes. And for some reason there was this knowing inside me. And that's when I heard, I heard myself, I guess, say, I will burn it down and build it back better. That mm -hmm. is what I will do. And that is where you've already won came in. You know, you mm -hmm. and I have our motto together. I tell my audience this all the time. You and I came up with this motto, I've already won. And it was born in when I called you and I said, I'll let it go. I'll let it go. We will dissolve the business. I will start from scratch. I know how to make money online now. I will start from scratch. And you said, then you've already won. Mm -hmm. I get chills every time I think of that because mm -hmm. that was like my, my turning point, that moment. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, I thought, okay. So I started to make decisions from a different place that day. Mm. That decisions from a place of possibility versus the pain is too much. Uh, the pain was still there, but it wasn't too much anymore. So I started making decisions. I want to pause. Yeah. You're making decisions from a different place. Yes. Because you said, I am willing to burn it down. Yes. I have done it before. I'll do it again. I'll do it again. Yeah. You came to the decision that you had already won. And selfishly, I want to. What? I think something. I think uh -huh, there's a frog in my throat. Um, okay, so at the time of this recording, um, a little bit ago, kind of went through a rough patch. You did. I went through a rough patch. You did. Don't even get that. The, your rough patch could get me crying. So don't even I get know, started. man. I went through a rough patch. And I remember I'm out, I'm walking in Newport Beach, the sun hasn't risen, and I'm sending you a voice memo. And I remember I was such in a state that my voice was shaking yes. and I was just like, I'm in a bad place. Yeah. I'm in a bad place. And you just, you didn't have to say much. You just said, sweet Jasmine, you're okay. You're okay. 
later that day, I come home to the most beautiful bouquet of flowers, <laughs> and all it said was you had already won yeah. Love Amy. And so what we created years ago still acts as a thing for me today because I had said, I'm gonna burn it all. You did. I'm gonna burn it all. Yes. And you had already won. So I want to invite people who are listening now mm -hmm. who are in pain, and then they take your advice from, I am willing to sit through the pain. I am willing to do the work that I need to do. I am willing to surround myself with friends, yes. perhaps get outside perspective yes. from a priest, a rabbi, a preacher, a therapist, anybody who you need to give an outsider's perspective. And then you get to a point of saying, I am willing to burn it down, knowing that you can borrow this mantra from Amy. And every time you're in that place of pain, what you hear is you have already won. So from that place, Ames, and you start dwelling in the land of possibility, what happens then? I love this question because what happens is you start making better decisions for yourself Oof. because you're looking toward the future. Oof. And that is when we decided to go to mediation where that wasn't even part of a discussion or part of the discussion at all. So we decided to go to mediation. Again, something I'd never done before, I was freaked out. And we went through a full day of mediation from, five, uh, or from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And mediation is very weird where you actually don't even see the person. You're in two different rooms, which oh, yes, who yes. knew? I yeah. did not. And so we sat there and kind of went back and forth, back and forth all day. And by 5 p.m., I called Hobie on the phone and I said, the business is mine. Mm -hmm. And that moment was my most favorite moment. And the, what he said, I'm sure he used a few bad words out <laughs> of excitement, but he was so excited too, because yes. he had seen me kind of a shell of a person for yes. the last year. And so we got to mediation because I don't know, you know, I don't know what my ex-partner would say, but for me, we got there because I was willing to let it go. And yep. that's what's so powerful. I think people listening yep. right now, they might not go through any partnership breakup or anything like that, but there is something that if they said, I'm willing to let this go to actually, I don't know what my future holds, but I know there's something better. Mm. I have a friend that always says, what's next is better. And I think that's a really good motto as well. And so I think I got to the place, what's next is better. I will figure out and make it better. Mm. And that's how we got there. And here's my favorite part of the story. Mm. I should say you have to read the book to get the punchline, but I'm going to give it here. Thank okay? you. All right. Thank you. See, so, so hold on. I feel like we need like a laser arm. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. This is an exclusive at the Jasmine Star Show. So <laughs> exclusive. Don't tell anyone because then they won't get it in the book. I went from $5 million the year that we ended the partnership to the very next year making $16 million That's in right. business. That's right. I wasn't going to say that. I'm so <laughs> glad she said it. We were afraid. We were afraid yes. of losing the five. Yes. And when we said we will burn yes. the ship. Yes. I you you were going to say something else to that, the word <laughs> well, ship. Both, I was like, you don't both. Both. Jasmine, burn, okay, both. Wait, I have to tell you all something about Jasmine. I think I've heard you say a cuss word one time in our whole friendship. <laughs> Where I hate to admit this, but the F word is one of my favorite words. I don't do it publicly, but behind the scenes. This is what Amy, I love about Amy. Everybody would look at me and be like, that girl totally. curses like a sailor. Yes. And Amy is just like angelic. And I was like, oh, the only thing holding up this girl's halo is her horns. Okay. So rude. Uh, so rude. So yes. truthful too. So yeah. truthful. I'm going to burn the ships. Burn but the yeah, ships. while you're burning the ships, you'll also be burning other things that, you know, somewhat sound like that. Yes. So you showed up entirely different. Your energy was different. And so you had you, you, you were saying that like not everybody's going to go through a partnership. Not everybody's going to dissolve it in the same way. But like let's bring it down to somebody who's listening now. And they know that even if they're not in a $5 million relationship that would ultimately turn out to $16 million after they let go what wasn't serving them. Right. When they're there, let's put it in the context of somebody who has a job yes. that is safe and secure. Yes. And maybe they don't have an acrimonious relationship with their boss. They like their boss. Yeah. Their boss is cool. Their coworkers are cool. They like their two weeks vacation. They like that there's a 401k. They like their insurance, but they know in that knowing, I, I'm not supposed to be here. Yes. What do they do? Yes. What, what kind of frameworks? Okay. So let's talk about this because typically you painted a pretty rosy experience where they like all the things, but they have this knowing. That's not typically... Well, because what I want to do, see, because I'm very dramatic, yeah. the juxtaposition. Like, somebody hears that and being like, okay, well, that's not me. I'm, maybe I like my coworkers. I don't like my boss. Or yeah. maybe I like oh, vacation. I, I got no insurance. Like, They're like, so my situation like, is worse. worse. See? Okay. Did you see how well, I set you up? Good. Like, that's yeah. what friends do. Okay, that like, I want to clap you up, queen. I'm setting you up. Setting the stage. Go ahead. I feel it. I feel Run it. it. Run okay. with it. Okay. So, with this, you know that there's something better for you. 
that's the piece you can't ignore. That's what I ignored yes. for a very long time yes. when I was still in my nine to five job. Yes. So if we go back to 14 years ago when I was in a corporate job, I actually did like my boss. I, I like to travel, I like the money, I like the benefits. Are we gonna mention and, who your boss was? Oh, Tony Robbins. Okay, because so, like, uh, yes. it's not like I like my boss. It's just like, this boss actually changes people's lives changes, and legacies. Yes. Like, yes, she had a good boss. And I got to like travel the yes. world and work on that content that he does on stage. Like, I had a yeah. good job. But I did have that knowing, so it's funny. Yeah. I was that person. Also, I was really uh, overworked at the time. Like I was working crazy hours, so there was that. I was everything wasn't perfect, but it was good. Yes. Anyway, point being, what do you do at that point? I had to get honest about what I really wanted. And mm. so taking the moment, you know, the why, we have to know our why, we talk about that all the time. In this situation, you need to know it at a deep level. Why is this not where you want to be? What is it that you really want? You have to start out with, I think, what do you not want? Like, let's get clear about what's not working for you. And then also, what do you want ultimately? Okay, and, so I'm gonna time out because I wanna make sure that there's like frameworks that people are actually okay. going to use. Yes. I, I wanna pause there and break it down a little bit. Amy says, you need to know why it's not working for you. And what I immediately heard somebody be like, I don't know. So if you don't know why immediately, then Amy suggests, if I heard it correctly, to list what you don't want. What do you not want? Like what's not working what's for you? What's not working for yes. you? And it could be in your present job or just in general. Like yes. I don't want to work weekends, even if you're not working weekends in your current job. Yes. You're just listing it in general. Yes. And then you're going to make a list of things that you actually do want that would light you up. And are you saying at the end of those two lists, you're going to figure out why it's not working in your current situation? Yes, but let's back up a little bit. Okay. Let's say asking people, what do you want? They could list two or three things pretty quickly. After that, it's usually very hard to get clear on what you want. Oof. And so here's one way to find out. When you're online and you're scrolling at night, where do you feel a tinge of jealousy or envy? Because when we feel jealous or envy of somebody else's success, you have to ask yourself, what about that do I want? Oh, that's so good. Yeah, I, because usually I feel guilty that I feel jealous about someone else's success, and I turn that guilt around instantly and say, what do they have, Amy, that you want? So Ooh, that's a, a way to look at so what do you want, right? Good. People might look at your life, and we're filming right now in your beautiful home in Newport Beach, and it's like uh, they look at you and they have a little tinge of, Jealousy, it might just because they want to be home filming in their living room with wonderful people and great environment. So that's the kind of thing you yeah. have to think about. Okay, so now once you get clear on what you don't want and what you do want, you start to ask yourself, am I willing to go through some unknowns, potential pain to get to where I ultimately want? Mm -hmm. And most of us are like, okay, I'm willing. But then you have to say, okay, what does that pain look like? Because you have to paint the picture of what might happen. Mm. You have to have the capacity for zero. That's where I came in. Are you willing to start with zero Instagram followers, zero people on your email list, and maybe make less than you made in your nine to five job the first or second year? Yes. So my first year out of corporate, I made just as much as I made at my Tony Robbins job. My second year, I made less. Because I was kind of experimenting, letting go of some clients that I didn't like, didn't know what I was doing. I made less. Okay, can we pause there? Yeah. Do you talk about this in the book? Like, talk about that I, year? I don't think I talk about that second year. Okay, because what I want to know is, what were you thinking in that second year? What was the story? What was the narrative? And then how did you actually get from, I made, I did, I performed worse. Yeah. So I'll be clear, I made $150,000 my first year of business. And I think I made like 120 or 130 the second year. So you said, okay, it's going in the wrong direction. Yes. What was the narrative? What was the thing that got you into the third year? Like what were the changes you made? What were the stories you told okay. yourself? Like this what was the good. mindset shift? Because the third year, I was fired. So okay. here's what happened. I decided I had a bunch of clients. So when I started my business, it looks wildly different than it looks today. And I tell all my students, the way your business looks this, the first two years of uh, starting out is wildly different than it will be in 10 years. So don't mm. think that all the decisions mm. you make are set in stone. That's so important. Good. Give yourself some flexibility and Good. grace. So what happened was the second year I had clients. I started out doing social media for small businesses and I had all these clients and no time to do what I ultimately always wanted to do, which was create digital courses and teach people through my courses. I knew when I left Robbins, that's what I wanted to do. No so idea you left how to do it though. Tony Robbins organization to build courses. Mm -hmm. And what you realized was that in order for me to get to that point, I need to take on some clients here to get me there. 
Well, the truth was I didn't know how to create digital courses by myself and I needed to make money right away. Got it. So I knew if I took clients, I could make money. Got it. And then I thought, I'll figure out how to make courses. And then a year passed, I wasn't making any courses. Mm. Second year, uh, halfway through, not making any courses. And then I had some clients that I hated 